I, uh, I want to continue. We're going to be in the book of Genesis, and I'm going to read Genesis 23 in just a second. And uh, you see in your bulletin the name of the, the sermon is The Fellowship of His Suffering. Um, this week links so closely with last week that if you missed last week, I urge you to go online um, on our website. It keeps things very up to date. Our, our bulletin insert, which you could follow along with, you have one for today, but from last week is on the website. You can go back and, and look at that. You can hear the sermon. Also CDs as of Wednesday night. They'll come to church from the previous week. And I've asked uh, in his next CD uh, preparation to put this week and last week together. And the reason I've done that is I'm going to challenge you. Some of you just need to hear the message again. I'm going to look forward to listening to the message again, not to hear myself speak, but because of what God's laid upon my heart. But you're also going to have somebody else that's laid upon your heart. Um, and and you, you pray about that. God, who is it that you want me to connect with with this? And that connection simply can be, I thought of you, and I thought this might be something you'd want to listen to. And don't underestimate the power of just those words and what God may do. And, and uh, I hope you get a blessing out of the message today that, that I have had as I've been putting this together. I would real quickly, uh, in case someone missed, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start from last week with our applications. And I'm going to read them fast. They're not going to be in your bulletin. Uh, the first half, but you can again find them, or if you want to see me, I'll give them to you. Last week, as we talked about tests, trials, tribulations, uh, temptation, and triumph, and how we have all of these things that happen in our life, uh, we said to everything there was a season and a time for every purpose under the heaven. There is a specific time, a season for each thing we go through in life. It's not just random acts, there's a season for different things to take place in our lives. Application number two, our faith will be tested. Now, tests come from God. Temptation comes from the devil. But our faith will be tested. God's testing is not the same as temptation. And God's purpose for test is to strengthen believers, while the devil's purpose for temptation is to destroy or to divide believers. It is possible for us to be both tested by God and tempted by the devil at the same time. This occurs in a place we commonly call tribulation. Tribulation is hard times in our life period. Some are tests, some are plainly temptation, and some are both. God will always test us with someone or something that is most valuable to us. Those are the hardest tests, but it's what God will test us with. And we end, ended our application last week with this word, Jehovah Jireh, which was out of Genesis chapter 22, I think around verse 14, where um, the sacrifice of Isaac was stayed and and. Abraham calls God Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. God will always provide. What I didn't get to do last week because of time, and I will this week, is the allegory of Genesis chapter 22. So you do have that in your, your insert if you'd like to follow along. And what is an allegory? If you were to look it up in Webster, it would say it's a story or a poem about a hitting a hidden meaning. But really when we look at allegories in Scripture, it is a story that goes to prophecy of a truth that's going to come later. And there's a really good reason that I want to go over these. And as we go over them, I want you to think the, the, the uh, comparison between Abraham and Isaac and God and Jesus, more especially Isaac the son and Jesus. And remember last week that Abraham was charged to take his son and to carry him to the place that God had desired and to sacrifice him. We know Abraham didn't do it, but he was willing to do it. So, number one, Isaac was a miracle baby. 
Uh, Sarah was barren, could not have children. We know that she was way older in age, in her 90s, when she actually uh, had Isaac. But Isaac was a miracle baby, just like Jesus, and really every one of our children. But Jesus was a miracle. There was a miracle. Jesus was from a virgin birth. Isaac was promised long before he was born. Abraham was told, this is going to happen. Jesus was told uh, all through the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. All through the Old Testament we see the promise one day of the Messiah coming, Jesus. Number three, Isaac was named before he was born. Jesus was named before he was born. In verse 2 of chapter 22, we hear Abraham was asked to take his only son. Now he had another son um, with, with um, I think it was Hagar. I get names all mixed up in my head. If you don't believe me, I'll change them in a minute. All right. But Isaac was, was told to take his only son. Uh, Abraham was told to take his only son, Isaac, because Isaac was the child with promise. We know that John 3.16 tells us that God took his only begotten son, right? We see this similarity as we look at it. Also in verse 2 it says, Whom ye love. The first time in Scripture that the word love is used. There's always something important about first that we see in Scripture. And I told you last week that this love defines a father's love for a son. And we see that God certainly had a father's love for his son. Further in verse 2, Abraham was told to accomplish the sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is a range of mountains, and it's the same place that Jesus would ultimately go to the cross and be sacrificed himself, where we get Golgotha or Calvary. In verse 4, it says, Then on the third day. Now, from the time Abraham was told, This is what you're to do, take your son. Go and you're going to sacrifice him. It was three days journey. And I just want you to think of it this way. In Abraham's mind from the time God told him what to do, his son was dead. And so we see three days. Now we look at Jesus, what happened? He was in the tomb three days. Now some would say, well, I think you're stretching it there. Look at it all together. Look at what God has put together in Scripture and in prophecy. Uh, verse 5, Abraham would worship because of the sacrifice. What was his response under so much pressure? He immediately went into worship. Also a first in Scripture. In chapter 22, I think it's verse 5, we see the word worship for the first time in Scripture. And we see what was his response to the pressures of life. He went closer to God. It was worship. In verse, uh, we would also see Jesus all through the New Testament Scripture, that early mornings, late evenings, where was He at? He was at a oneness with God. Uh, verse 6, Isaac carried the wood in which he would be sacrificed on. Jesus carried the tree in which he would be sacrificed on. Isaac would be a voluntary sacrifice. Now we don't see where he said, hey, do me. But what we do see is a conversation between Isaac and Abraham. And it says Abraham bound Isaac, but we see no struggle, no fight whatsoever. Isaac was a voluntary sacrifice. Jesus was a voluntary sacrifice. By the way, did either want to do it? The answer is no. Remember in the New Testament, as Jesus is about to go, He's like, God, take this from me. But He understood, I must. It was a voluntary sacrifice. And the last one I will compare in verse 10. Isaac would face death by his father, and Jesus would face death by his father. You know, I want to I wanna talk just real about life as we go through this. I can't help but try to picture what it must have been like for Abraham. Young man, we don't know much about him. Things seem to be going okay. Trials, joys, trials, joys. But we know when it started recorded in history that he was told to leave. He had to take his, his nephew, his nephew's father, Lot's father was dead. He had to take his nephew and he ended up under, for a little while, under Sarah's father. Uh, 
you know, or, or a, a, fa a father-in-law, we, we see that times in Abraham's life seem to have a blessing, and then before you know it, there's a challenge. I'm not going to go over all the challenges we've been through, but it's up and it's down. Has that ever happened to anybody else in life? Is that not life for us? We're here, and then we're there. <laughs> you know, sometimes we say, I want to be right here. I want to be here. You know, I'm just telling you that. But we have those ups and downs, and, and there's great joys. I told you before chapter 22 that there was this long period of peace in Abraham and Sarah's life and Isaac. They had this family time together. It was a wonderful picture. And then the stress, could you imagine, most of us say, I could not do what he was asked to do in chapter 22, to sacrifice his son. But then we see God provided, so he's like back up here again. Right? We have these ups and downs. Now I want you to read with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 23, as we see the very next thing that Abraham is faced with. And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. That's 127 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as in Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and weep for her. The very next thing recorded in history that Abraham has to deal with is the death of his best friend. When you have been married for a long time, you understand that your husband, your wife, your spouse is your best friend. Can you imagine the experiences that they have had together, both good and hard? The struggles they've learned to go through in life together. The fights they've had. You know, I don't know what a frying pan looked like then, but I'm sure Abraham got it a time or two, okay? But whatever the things they have experienced in life together and to be used by God in miraculous ways. Seems like God is just right there. He provides everything and boom, Sarah passes. So what's the appropriate response, appropriate response when we have death? There's mourning. You know, um, every now and then I will hear a Christian brother or sister with good intent say, you know what, you shouldn't cry. If we're Christians, we shouldn't cry. We shouldn't mourn. And I just want you to know that's not in Scripture. God designed us to mourn. That's why we have tear ducts. That's why they're connected in our emotion. It's not a matter of our faith that we mourn. No, we can still have strong faith and mourn the loss of someone very special in our life. It's okay. There is a time for mourning. Now, what I want you to see, there's a transition that takes between verse 2 and verse 3. It says at the end of verse 2, And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Verse 3, And Abraham stood up from before his dead. Now we think of this like, that all happened in 60 seconds. I don't know how long Abraham mourned for Sarah, but there was a point that is signified by the verbiage, he stood up, in to say he was changing his countenance, his countenance, to say it correctly. Abraham stood up from before his dead. He decided, although still in mourning, it was time to move to the next stage. He stood up and he spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, Now before I read this next part, and I'm going to read really fast, and there's some King James English in there, which some of you will think I pronounced wrong, but that just means you heard it wrong. Okay? But, but I want you to know what's happening is Abraham and his wife and his family, they're all not at home. They're in somebody else's land. That's where they've been. Now, they're able to occupy part of that land, but it's not their land. They're somewhere else. They're visitors in another country. Something else that adds kind of stress to your suffering, right? What do I do? It's not like we can go home to the normal uh, burial place. What do I do? Well, let's listen to Abraham's conversation. Verse 4, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. 
That sounds kind of bad, but it's just the English. He wasn't saying he didn't want to see Sarah anymore. Verse 5, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchre, bury the dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but they that mayest bury thy dead. And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me, and entreat for me to Ephron the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it to me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. And Ephraim dwelt among the children of Heth, and Ephraim the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience with the ch as of the children of Heth, even of all that went into the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of thy sons of my people give I it thee. Bury thy dead." And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land, and he spake unto Ephraim in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field, take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. And Ephraim answered Abraham, saying unto him, My Lord, hearken unto me, the land is worth four hundred shekels of silver. What is that betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver that was named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver current money, which is in the merchant. And it goes on to say that he buys that area, and he buries Sarah. Now, you might read this and think, well, hey, these are nice people. I want you to understand actually what is being recorded here. Here is Abraham... He's in a place as a visitor. He owns no land. He needs to bury Sarah. And he needs to have a place that he can visit her again, and it's going to be okay. And so with this, he goes and he says to the people, I need a place that I can bury her. And it sounds like they're saying, oh, sure, you can have any place. You're a mighty prince among us. Take whatever place you want. And he finds the right place. And he says, this is the place I want. And that individual stands up that owns it and says, oh, what is it between me and you? Go ahead and you can bury your dead here. But he has no intent. I want you to understand, there is zero intent to give that land to Abraham. It sounds like he is, but that's a way of negotiation of the old time Middle East. It always starts off like a gift, but then it gets down to a whole lot of negotiation of price. So he has no intention, and we see Abraham, what does he pay for this land? 400 shekels of silver. Now, we don't have a clue what that means. We can say, well, how much money is that? And what's it worth? And so on. Let me just give you this analogy. A little bit later in Scripture, David needs to buy a place to build an altar to the Lord. It later becomes the city of David. And the place he finds, I think it's in First or Second Samuel, but it's a place that's a threshing floor owned by Aruna the Jebusite. And David says, I need to buy this place to build an altar to the Lord. And Aruna says, take it, it's yours, I give it to you. David says, I will not give to God anything I took for free. That's a, something in that for us. All right? And so what did he do? He paid him. You know how much he paid for that land? Fifty shekels of silver. Way more land, a bigger place, prime land for 50 shekels of silver later in history. Do you understand Abraham is paying 400 shekels of silver? So here, let me ask you this. If you've had to be in the position of taking care of things when you've lost someone in your family, is it all easy? Is everything just work out great? There's struggles that go along. You would think, okay, I'm at this struggle. God, I can't take anything else. And what happens? We have more struggle. We have more. That's the whole purpose that, that I, I want us to, to look at here in Abraham's life. He's growing in his faith mightily for the Lord. But he's still having hard things that are taking place for him. So let me kind of change gears for a minute and just talk about suffering. Why do we have suffering? 
Where's God? You hear people all the time that don't know God that say, oh, what kind of God is that that allows these things? You know what? There's Christians that say the same thing. I don't understand, God. Why would you do this to me? Why did you do this to me, God? Why do we have suffering? Genesis chapter 3. It's one little word, and it's called sin. Genesis tells us, because of sin entering the world, there will be suffering. There will be sickness. There will be decay. There will be death. He talks about the man. He talks about the woman. He talks about the devil. He even, God, talks about the world itself groans to be um, renewed. Because of sin, we have suffering. So, application number two. And I want you to listen good to this one. Suffering is not specifically associated with good or bad behavior. So many times in our life, we, we think, well, you know what? That person's suffering because they've done bad. They're getting just what they deserve. How many of you have, have thought that before? You, you, there's some lying people in this church. I'm just telling you that. <laughs> some of you have thought, oh, wish they, why aren't they getting what they deserve? I think they should get so-and-so. And it's not happening. You've also looked exactly the opposite. And you've saw someone that you really admire. Just has a wonderful relationship with the Lord. They, they know the right words to say in their family. They're loving, caring people. And they're suffering. And you can't understand that. What, what's wrong? What did I do? Or what did that person do? I want you to understand this application. Suffering is not specifically associated with good and bad behavior. Can you do something to bring suffering on? Yes, you can. But not all suffering is because of that. In John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3, there is a blind man. You can see the scripture. I'm not going to read it. There's a blind man, and Jesus is walking with his disciples, and his disciples ask Jesus, this man's been blind from birth uh, who's, who was it that sinned so great? Who's being punished? Is it the man or was it his parents? And this has been passed down to him. And Jesus says in verse 3, you don't understand. He tells that God has a higher purpose for the very suffering this individual is going through. Now, if we're, if we're not careful with that, we say, well, wait a minute. So God made this man suffer for God's own purpose? No, no, no. I really think so many times in life... We equate that God has had a hand in suffering when God has not brought suffering upon us. Sin has brought suffering upon us. But Romans 8, 28, 29 says, No matter what, God will take it for the Christian and work it to good. We wrongly equate that suffering should only happen to bad people. Now when we do that, it's judging. Because we're somehow elevating that we're not a bad person. And that suffering's only happening to somebody else that's bad. And, you know, Scripture is very specific. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all deserve death according to Scripture. So, we wrongly equate suffering should only be with bad people. But suffering is not specifically associated with good or bad behavior. Application number three. God does have a higher purpose in the use of suffering. Uh, in the book of Isaiah, God says this in, in verse 50, chapter 55, verses 8 and 9. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What God is saying is, you don't understand things the same way I understand things. We were made in His image. But can you imagine what the mind of God actually is? We know so little. But we try to put things in our box of understanding. And sometimes we wrongly accuse God. But God does have a higher purpose in our suffering. Again, Romans 8, 28 and 29 it says that all things work for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. And in verse 29, what's the reason for that? That we're conformed to the image of His Son. Application number four. What is God's higher purpose? Preacher, you say, there's a purpose. What is it? I need to know. What is the higher purpose for suffering? Suffering is directly linked with the growth and maturity 
of our faith. I want you to, um, to, to go with me through some scriptures, and they'll come up on the screen. And first I'm going to go to the book of John, chapter 16. And in John, chapter 16, um, we have Jesus that is about to go to the cross, and He is telling His disciples they're about to face the largest, uh, the most tribulation they've ever had. Suffering is directly linked with the growth and maturity of our faith, and God uses suffering so that we will cling to Him. Verse 33, Jesus speaking, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. We seek peace in so many other ways, but in our times of trials and tribulation, we seek Him and we find peace. We cling to that. He says, In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You know, there's an added benefit that when we have walked through suffering with God, 1 Corinthians, I think it's chapter 4, um, tells us that, that, let me make sure I got that right, because uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, that it talks about how we can take the very suffering we've gone and we can share it with someone else, but that's not the purpose of suffering. That's just an added benefit. God uses suffering so that we will cling to Him. Number two of application four. God uses suffering to prove to us that our faith is real through the experience of suffering in this world. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, I'm going to talk about verse 2, but you really should read verses 1 and 2 together. In this, we see in the book of Hebrews that the writer is saying this, that Jesus is the perfecter of our faith. That things that are happening around us, He will take whatever those things are and perfect our faith faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7 it tells us that we are tested. Our faith is tested by fire. Write this note if you, if you really want to get in there. Read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 10. Not now. Listen to me now. But later read this. It's a, it, it goes deeper in an understanding of the trying of our faith and the tribulation that we are in now. In James 1, 2, that's why it says, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, divers various trials and tribulations in your life. God uses suffering to prove to us that our faith is real. We see, you know what, there's no way I could have made it through that without God. And it builds us stronger. Third one, I believe God uses suffering to stop us from focusing on this world and turn our attention to the next. In Romans chapter 18, I want to read verse 30, excuse me, John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus again, He's on trial. He could have called a legion of angels and just took out everybody around Him. He's getting, He's in front of Pilate and being questioned. This is what Jesus says, verse 36 of John 18. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. He's saying there's a kingdom ahead. Now for believers today, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can live in His kingdom here on earth. His kingdom is in front of us now. But we need to be focused on living in that kingdom. You know, if we're honest with ourselves, we spend a whole lot of time thinking about the here and now and not the where we hope to be one day. So, preacher, you have said a lot. Now let's just get real. Paul was a persecutor of the church. Highly educated, from the right family. He was both a Roman uh, citizen and a, a, a Jew. He had bloodlines. He had all kinds of things. He just had it made. He was in right position. He was the guy persecuting the church. And one day on the road to Damascus, he met Jesus. He was literally blinded by the light. All right. And from there in Acts chapter 9, we see that um, Jesus says, I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And I used to wrongly equate that Paul was suffering for Jesus' sake because He persecuted the church, but that's actually wrong. We all will suffer for the name of Jesus. 
Let me go a little bit further with this, and, and this is really what's laid upon my heart. If you would, go with me to the book of Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read through verses 1 through 14. I'll read kind of fast. You listen fast. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write these things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but to you it's safe. He's saying, hey, you can trust what it is I'm saying. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision, for we are the circumcision. He's saying there's false prophets that are going to give you the wrong information, which worship God in spirit. That's through our faith that we receive the Holy Spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The next verses, verses 4 through 7, Paul speaks of how good he is. He says, if I wanted to brag, I could brag. I was born on this day. I circumcised on the eighth day. I'm of this family. I was educated by this guy. I got all these good things. But you know what Paul says about that? He says, I count all of that for loss. None of that matters because nothing we achieve by our own works matters. He's like, get off of that thought. But go with me, verse 8. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Is there anybody here today that would like to have the knowledge of Jesus Christ? I think that would be pretty good. That's us being conformed to His image. Go with me. We, we would like that. He goes on, For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, all worldly things, all prideful things, all of the world are gone. I count them but dung. Dung is what dung sounds like. That I may win Christ. Verse 9, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, not of me doing what's right or wrong, um, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. He brings it back to faith, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Then he says in verse 10, that I may know Him. Anybody want to know Him? I want to know Him. Look at the next part. It says that, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. That means the very power that raised Jesus from the dead. Anybody want to know that in your life? Because that's in every believer in the Holy Spirit. He says, that's what I want. Does anybody want that? I think we want that in life. Notice as he, he continues on, he says, um, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings. <laughs> Who's ready for that? You know, the truth is most of us would say, I'm not looking forward to the fellowship of His sufferings. Jesus died. He went to the cross. He was tortured. If you don't hear anything else that I have said today, listen to this. Think about what He is saying. I want to know the fellowship of His sufferings. When things go wrong, our support network kind of thins, doesn't it? I mean, good people that love us and want to be there for us don't know what to say, so they don't come around. You know, it's not bad. It's just they just don't know any better. And the Lord knows if somebody thinks you've done something wrong, it's like, I don't know Him. Things get really Lonely, quickly, in suffering. It doesn't have to be death. It could be anything. When we're facing trials and tribulations, it gets lonely. But I want you to know there's a fellowship there with Jesus Christ. Who was Jesus' friend on the day He was nailed to the cross? Peter denied Him how many times? All of His people ran and scattered the fellowship of his suffering. He was by himself. Here's what I want you to get out of this. Where's Paul going? What is the fellowship of his suffering? There is a fellowship with God that can happen during suffering like no other time in your earthly life. There's no other distraction. The world stops. Nothing else matters. I want to be in fellowship with Him. It draws me closer to Him. Notice what it, it says here. He says again, and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable. I want to be conformed to the image of the Son. 
if by any means I might obtain the resurrection of the dead. I want to go to one other scripture. If you would, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 with me. We're going to look at Paul again. Something happens with Paul. Some people say, this is crazy. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about a third heaven. Now, wait a minute, there's not a third heaven. I want you to understand it this way, the heavens used in Scripture as we look at it. Where planes fly right now and where birds fly, the sky, that's the first heaven. The galaxy where we see other galaxies, planets that we have no clue of how big it really is, that's the second heaven. The third heaven is where God resides, just real quickly to move through that. He says this in chapter 12, Paul speaking, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. In other words, I'm not going to brag. I will come to visions and revelations. He says, I'm just going to get to the truth of what's been shown to me. I know a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one called up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. How that he was called up in the paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul is speaking that either he was physically carried into God's presence or through a vision he was in God's presence. But it's no doubt the Holy Spirit brought a message to Paul. And what Paul is saying is there's nothing special about me. I could brag about, hey, I was pulled to the third heaven. But what he's saying is that's not even worth talking about. So he goes on. Of such one, verse 5, I... One will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. Paul says, I'm only going to focus on one thing to bring glory and honor to. And what does he say? I'm going to focus on my infirmities? I mean, who wants to do that? But that's where Paul's mind is. Notice what it says. Verse 6, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. It's foolish to talk prideful that we're something special that we're not. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or even heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted because of this vision he was given, above measure through the abundance of revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Paul got to experience a tremendous, miraculous fellowship with God, and the devil attacked him with some additional infirmity. What does Paul do about it? What do we do? We go to the Lord in prayer, right? Look what Paul did. It says in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it may depart from me. Paul prayed, God, I've got this infirmity. Remove it. God, I've got this infirmity. Remove it. God, I have this infirmity. Remove it. But God did not remove it. But he got a word. Verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. In our weakness, the strength of God is made perfect. That's the, the glory of suffering, whatever it is. It's a time for us to have a closeness and a fellowship with God beyond any other time of fellowship in this earthly life. You know, we in this church have prayed for individuals in their suffering and seen no answer. Amen? And it hurts. We've prayed for the next individual and seen God miraculously change what's taking place in their life. And we ask, why? Is one better than the other? God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Our job is to go to Him with our request. He says, make your request be made known to me. And He'll answer our prayers. It's not always the way we expect the answer to be. But notice what Paul said. Jesus speaking to him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for in my weakness you are made perfect. Notice it goes on. So Paul says in verse 9, Most gladly. 
He's excited. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's understanding that in the trials and tribulations, the tough times in my life, when I'm down in the pit, that Jesus rests upon me more during that time than any other time in my life. It is a glorious place to be. Nobody wants to be in suffering, but what a place we get to fellowship with God. Don't blame God when you're there. Reach to Him and ask for His comfort and experience experience the presence of God like you have never experienced before. There's such, such a truth that we see in this statement. He goes on. I shut my Bible. I got so excited. Notice that these rest of these words, he says, I take pleasures and in infirmities in reproaches, when people are fighting with him, in necessities, when there's something he needs, in persecutions, when he's being persecuted for Christ, when he's in distress, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I want to go back to Genesis and I'll close. I still just can't imagine what it's like for Abraham. Up, down, up, down, up, down. I have walked with many of you up and down. And each one of you are at different places right now. Understand, we're going to be tested. You're also going to be tempted. Understand who it comes from and what it's all about. God will never allow us to be tested by Him in which He has not prepared us to pass the test. God will never allow us to be tempted by the devil where God has not given us a way to escape. That's scripture. That's promises that are given to us. But sometimes we can't break out of the morning. Whether it's a loss of life, whether it's an event that's happened in our life, whether it's relational or a job, we get angry. We have all of these things that hold us at one place. And we don't experience the fellowship of suffering with Jesus. Listen to what the Word says today. Paul got it right. He passed the test. It's going to be said of him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Because he understood that in the suffering of life, he was able to experience God like no other time. Look for it. For the fellowship with Jesus Christ. Back in Genesis 22, we're going to go back at verse 14. I ended last week, and Abraham called the name of the place where he was about to sacrifice Isaac, and it was stayed Jehovah Jireh, which means um, that the Lord will provide. I want you to read just a few more verses. And the angel of the Lord, verse 15, called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. He says in verse 17, That in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars are of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast. And this word, obeyed, is the first time that the word obeyed shows up in Scripture. Obedience to God's word is a form of fellowship and worship. I don't know where you are today. As Kathy comes and plays, we're not going to sing. Um, I know we've had great challenges. We've had great joys. God is at work in this church. He's at work at individual lives. There's things going on in, in your family. and you, Some of you think you're alone, but you're not. Even though people are sitting beside you, you feel like you're alone, but you're not. Don't believe that temptation of the devil. You are not alone. God will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Suffering is a place where you can get closer to God. God's not some evil master that decided to slap you with suffering today. No, because of sin we have suffering. But God is there to walk you through it 
to build your faith stronger and stronger to bring you closer to Him. And I just ask you, I'm going to pray in just a second. We're going to stand as Kathy plays. If uh, God has just spoken to you in some way today, I don't know what that way is, but, but you just feel like coming and praising Him or you need prayer, maybe you're accepting the Lord, maybe you're giving your life again to Him, I don't know, but whatever it is, would you respond as I pray, as we stand together, I pray, would you come if God lays it upon your heart? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this day. God, you're so good to us. And uh, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the message. I thank you for the truths that God we see in your scripture. And God, it's hard to understand that because our worldly values, the things we've been taught of success and what is good and bad are so different than what you have designed in your word. And God, we struggle with that. We think times that uh, bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people, but God, we're all bad in your eyes. But oh, for the grace that is sufficient that in our weakness we are made strong. Your grace is perfect. Oh God, we thank you for that. May we understand what Paul was saying in the fellowship of his suffering, remembering the scars of Jesus' hand and his feet that so much was accomplished on the cross. And God, may we just look at this world differently. May we understand this world is not our home, that we're in preparation of what is to come. But God, may we live in your kingdom now on earth. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>